welcome back to campus. I'm glad to see you all here. Um, my name is Andy Geronimo. I'm a lecturer in law here, and I'm the director of the First Amendment Clinic. Um, in our clinic, we work with third-year law students um, who are certified legal interns by the Ohio Supreme Court. So they practice under the supervision of myself and actually under the supervision of uh, our fellow Sarah Coulter here, who is a fourth-year attorney. Um, and we do a lot of different kinds of work. So we, uh, the First Amendment touches on a lot of different areas of law. We do some affirmative civil rights litigation under Section 1983. We also do some news gathering activities for some of our journalism clients. We help them with the Ohio Public Records Act, uh, with federal FOIA, and with um, news gathering um, activities generally. But we also uh, occasionally get involved in a defensive posture, asserting a First Amendment defense to a tort like defamation. Um, I'm glad to see you all here today and welcome back to campus. Um, defamation is a hot topic. Uh, even yesterday, the New York Times famed First Amendment lawyer, Floyd Abrams, who's tried some of the biggest First Amendment cases uh, in the Supreme Court's history, wrote this op-ed in the New York Times about the Supreme Court potentially reviewing the New York Times versus Sullivan actual malice standard uh, for public figures, which is a standard that uh, public figures, public officials, and limited purpose public figures, as the court has defined them. Uh, it's, an, it's a higher standard that they have to meet in order to recover for defamation damages. Um, the Supreme Court is set to review potentially cases that would re-examine that standard. Um, and defamation just generally has been um, a, a hot topic, as I've said. So, you know, there are competing interests in defamation cases. Um, one of the things that we're seeing lately, especially in our current environment, is uh, allegations of misinformation, allegations of disinformation, and a general concern about what is truth, right? The, the title of this presentation, Truth, Lies, and Malice, um, it, it's a hairy question about who gets to decide what the truth is and when courts or the government should get involved to determine uh, whether any liability exists for uh, disinformation or untruths or false statements or even affirmative misinformation. Um, so obviously there's lots of attention on, on things like this. Um, and, and, you know, as a First Amendment lawyer, we, we are always trained to come back to the idea that the government should not be the ones that are in the position of determining what truth is. Uh, it's the reason that we have the jury trial so that that fact-finding mission is sort of outsourced to the, the polity generally. Um, and, it, and it's a concern of, of a lot of people about what to do in this new environment that's driven by the internet, that's driven by the fractured media environment, um, and, and other things that have uh, impacted how defamation cases proceed or um, people think about defamation cases generally. One thing to start off to clear some of the brush on some of this is um, there's a very popular, um, although untrue, legal opinion out there that false speech is unprotected by the First Amendment. Um, that's not true. There are certainly lots of um, criminal statutes or civil tort theories that publish, or I'm sorry, that punish false speech, that, that hold people liable for false speech, um, but it's not true that categorically uh, the First Amendment provides an exception for false speech just on the basis that it's false. Uh, the case that I've excerpted here is a case called United States versus Alvarez, uh, examining the constitutionality of a, uh, a statute called the Stolen Valor Act, uh, where somebody could say that they were in the military and they earned certain awards, and Congress said that it's illegal to do that. It's illegal to pretend that you're a decorated military officer. The Supreme Court, viewing that, uh, that act found that it was unconstitutional under the First Amendment, that it was a content-based restriction. Um, and, and basically what the government did in that case is they proposed a rule of law that false statements are unprotected by the First Amendment generally, uh, and the Supreme Court readily rejected that, that uh, conclusion. Um, we do punish false statements uh, under certain legal theories, right? We pu punish uh, perjury. Um, a, a false statement made under oath for the purposes, though, of, of improving the judicial process and improving the, the fact-finding process um, and, and preventing obstruction thereof. You know, we, we, um, we hold people liable for fraud or criminally liable for fraud in instances where there is reliance 
and somebody has relied on a false statement such that they've been damaged. Uh, and certainly, um, I don't think I can make this into a professionalism CLE, but you know, as attorneys, we are prohibited from, from saying certain false statements. And that is sort of, again, in the interests of a, a better, of, uh, more efficient judicial system. So it's important to keep in mind that defamation um, doesn't punish false statements just as a virtue of punishing them as false. It's not that the falsity that we're truly trying to, to remedy with the state tort law of defamation, it's more so that if somebody's opinion, I'm, I'm sorry, if somebody's reputation is damaged, um, we, we punish the false statement as incidental to compensating those people for uh, the, the harms to their reputation. So uh, again, thinking about how how popular um, or, or how defamation cases have come sort of to the fore, um, we can think about former President Trump. Former President Trump notoriously asked for libel laws to be opened up. He's participated in defamation cases as a plaintiff and as a defendant, um, and, and has certainly put this idea sort of more at top of mind of folks. Um, we've also seen some high profile defamation cases related to the 2020 election. Uh, where Dominion Voting Systems and Smartmatic have sued certain people and certain media entities for what they say are false statements about the results of the 2020 election. Um, it's a very interesting set of cases um, because again, getting back to those sort of rudimentary First Amendment principles where we value the First Amendment insofar as it allows us to be an informed and, and really um, participatory democracy, um, it's, it's an interesting tension where we would normally say that, you know, defamation verdicts might chill that kind of political speech, and especially when it goes to core political issues, but there are also a lot of people concerned about whether these statements were false and, and whether somebody should be hold, held accountable for, for these things. And, it, um, you know, we won't get as far into the weeds on this because I really do want to focus on the constitutional issues, but there are also interesting layers to all of these cases. Um, Dominion and Smartmatic brought a series of cases, not only against Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani and folks like that, but also networks themselves against Fox News and One American News Network. Um, and, and it gets to interesting questions about who has published the, the statement and who is responsible for continually disseminating those types of things. Uh, and also sort of uh, dovetails interestingly with um, with the idea of online speech and distributor liability and those types of things. Who's responsible, um, not just for the original statements themselves, but uh, you know, the dissemination of those statements generally. It's not just high profile uh, defamation cases either. There's plenty of defamation cases out there and this is um, a, an excerpt of things from uh, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, which is, uh, they have a project called the Anti-Slap Stories SLAP is an acronym that uh, lots of uh, defamation First Amendment lawyers use. Uh, the acronym is for Strategic Litigation Against Public Participation. Um, so this is from their anti-SLAP stories um, series. And, and it's, again, it's not just you know, the highest profile of political things happening where it's the president or an election. Um, people are sued for defamation for bad Yelp reviews, uh, for, their, for their activism. Um, for sending out mailers notifying somebody about somebody, uh, uh, an elected official or a, a candidate for public office's prior history. Um, so it's important to keep in mind sort of the scope of defamation cases. Um, and, and it's not just those high profile ones you see. It sort of embodies the idea that there are certain times when defamation theories are advanced for the purposes of uh, a powerful person trying to silence a less powerful person. Uh, and and the, the idea that the courts go along with that um, is, uh, is, is what implicates the First Amendment here. So uh, again, in the interest of clearing some brush around some of the things that you might commonly hear, um, some people talk about defamation cases and say, you know, I'm just a private person suing another private person. The First Amendment only restricts government activity. So how is this a First Amendment problem? Uh, in New York Times versus Sullivan, the, the Supreme Court clarified that the court's involvement is the state action that we're concerned about. So it's not just that one party has asked, uh, you know, another party to stop speaking or correct their speech. It's that they've invoked the power of the courts 
to either ship money from the defendant to the plaintiff, or in some cases, uh, and I've even participated in some amicus briefing in the Ohio Supreme Court on this issue, in some cases ask for an injunction or a prior restraint uh, to prevent those statements from being issued generally. Um, so defamation is a First Amendment issue, even when no government official is involved, but there are also plenty of defamation cases that involve government officials, and there are additional constitutional standards that go along with that. And getting back to sort of, you know, the, the baseline level of why we value a constitutional limit uh, on defamation cases. This is a Brandeis who's sort of the classic marketplace of ideas person who talks uh, more so about um, the value of speech generally and the, in it, having it work out in the marketplace of ideas rather than public punishing it sort of ex ante in the first instance. Um, this slide, when I bring it up in class, I usually read the whole thing because it's sort of impassioned, but I will leave you all with just that. Um, you know, order cannot be secured merely through fear of punishment for its infraction. It's hazardous to discourage thought, hope, and imagination that fear breeds repression, repression breeds hate, hate menaces stable government, and the path of safety lies in the opportunity to discuss freely supposed grievances and proposed remedies, and that the fitting remedy for evil counsels is good ones. This is that classic marketplace of ideas issue uh, or, or concept where even if there are some false statements out there and even if you think you may have been damaged by some false statements, uh, really your, your primary remedy should be more speech, counter speech, telling somebody, publicizing why the statement that you think is false is false and, and supporting that with your own evidence. Um, and, and just as a, a again, a, a bedrock idea of this, um, the New York Times versus Sullivan Court quoted a, uh, an older case from 1942 and basically said, whatever is added to the field of libel is taken from the field of free debate. Uh, and it's not just that a, a libel judgment might do this, um, it's also that the threat of a libel judgment might do this. So if you know that the person you hope to criticize, whether it's a, a business entity, whether it's a, a politician, or whether it's you know your family member or your neighbor or something, if you know that that person is litigious and is willing to bring a defamation suit, um, you may be chilled by, by um, uh, publishing that criticism. So the, the, the actual um, sort of borders of the constitutional protection has been uh, described as the court as this actual malice standard. And it's important to remember that malice in this case is a term of art. Um, actual malice means uh, that, a, that a plaintiff has to prove in certain cases that uh, a, a defendant knowingly made a false statement. Uh, so it's, it, it's not malice as you might presume it in other tort actions and you can't um, sort of apply other non-defamation cases to show what malice truly is. It just doesn't mean that you did it for a bad reason or that you intended to harm somebody. It really, the malice goes to the truth element more so than the intent element. Uh, so malice really means that you knew something was false and you said it anyway. And again, this is a constitutional requirement. Although we are typically in state courts for cases like defamation, this is a way that the federal constitutional law caps that, that uh, the availability of liability for that type of tort action. Uh, state defamation law is constitutional up to the point, and only up to the point, where it implicates First Amendment freedoms. Um, actual malice also bears upon plain, private plaintiffs as well. So, you know, the status of a plaintiff is a key consideration because if you're a public official, a public figure, or a limited purpose public figure, you have to show out actual malice to recover. Even if you're a purely private plaintiff, you also have to show actual malice uh, to recover certain kinds of fees, uh, to recover punitive damages or attorney's fees. Uh, you'll have to show actual malice. And if, if anybody has any questions, we've got a small enough group that I, I would welcome you to jump in here if anybody wishes to. Um, otherwise, I'll just continue plugging along. Um, again, these are the competing interests that we keep in mind in defamation law. Um, if the idea that there is a tort, and it was a tort at common law, that provides compensation for damages. So there's a, a measure of accountability involved. Uh, it makes sure that our, our public dialogue is sort of rooted or anchored in some way in truth. Um, and it, it disincentivizes knowingly false statements. 
Um, again, getting back to the, the First Amendment ideal that we value political speech and we want people to be able to speak, uh, there's also the idea that if, you know people who knowingly put out false statements should be discouraged from doing so because it, it improves the quality of our discourse. Um, the, the, the interest that competes against that from a First Amendment perspective is this idea that, uh, that there is no such thing as a false opinion, that everybody's entitled to their own opinion, um, and they, uh, we shouldn't depend on the courts uh, or the government to correct that. What we should depend on uh, to correct that is more speech. So getting into the, uh, the weeds a little bit, and I don't intend this to be a, a primer on defamation cases generally. I'm, I'm sort of wanting to talk about the constitutional uh, uh, issues surrounding it. Um, but, but in Ohio, at least, the elements of defamation are a false statement of fact, that it was defamatory and of and concerning the plaintiff. So there has to be some implication of some defamatory material in there uh, that would hurt somebody's reputation. The statement has to be published. Uh, it has to be the proximate cause of a plaintiff's injury, and it has to be made with the requisite level of fault. And again, the, the level of fault gets back to the status of the plaintiff. Uh, it, it either has to be actual malice for public officials, public figures, or limited purpose public figures, uh, or even for pri private plaintiffs trying to recover actual, uh, I'm sorry, punitive damages or attorney's fees have to show this actual malice standard. Ohio recognizes two kinds of defamation cases. Uh, these are the two different theories that plaintiffs in Ohio can pursue uh, for a, a cause of action for defamation, per se defamation and per quad defamation. And what I'm trying to get at here a little bit is the ways that the, the substantive law and the procedure um, allow certain libel actions to proceed, whereas other law and procedure may not. Um, so a per se defamatory statement is defamatory on its face. It has these sort of, in my mind, archaic categories of, of statements that could be defamatory on their face um, that, is, that involves an infamous punishment, uh, an allegation of criminal conduct that somebody's been convicted of a crime or has committed a very serious crime, an offensive and contagious disease um, that I'm just gonna leave here now given our current environment and all the masks that we're wearing, um, an injury to a trade or occupation, you know, something saying that somebody is as incompetent or, you know, I had this plumber over and they totally ruined my pipes, uh, even though that wasn't true, uh, and something that, again, subjects somebody to public hatred, ridicule, or contempt. Um, these can sometimes get somewhat problematic, determining what exactly is a, is a statement that's defamation per se, as you can, you know, lawyers in the room, you can understand how we could argue how, you know, one statement subjects somebody to public hatred or ridicule or contempt, and somebody could easily make the argument that it doesn't. Uh, the, in the, the important consideration here is whether a particular statement is per se defamation is a matter of law for the court to decide. Um, I would say that what that means is notwithstanding Ohio's notice pleading standards, that if you try to plead a per se defamation case, you have to identify specifically what the statement is and how that statement is defamatory and it has to be defamatory on its face. Um, I don't wanna to dive too much into this because we have an active defamation case on which we briefed this issue in particular, um, but I will, I will say that uh, as a lawyer, it's hard to rely on things that haven't gone through the full appellate process and things like that. Um, but that would be my position on the, on, the, uh, on the matter, and I think it's important uh, protection if you're trying to proceed on a per se defamation claim. Um, the other important thing and the reason why that limitation exists in my mind is because you do not need to prove damages as a per se defamation plaintiff. These types of things are so serious that the courts say we're going to presume damages here and we're not going to require a plaintiff to prove them. Um, in my mind, if you're going to presume those damages, uh, the courts also have an obligation up front to screen these types of cases to make sure that um, it's actually a, a defamatory statement on its face and not um, pull defendants into litigation into an expensive discovery process. Uh, you know, the, the trials and tribulations of being a, a civil litigant um, without uh, that showing, you know, as an initial matter, as a pleading matter. The other type of defamation cases are per quad cases, and these are cases 
that you do have to prove damages for, but these are types of statements that um, require some external knowledge of something. So again, if we get back to the elements of defamation, um, if it's a statement, the second element here, that a statement has to be defamatory to towards a plaintiff, it's often called the of and concerning element. Um, you could picture a, a type of defamatory statement that doesn't specifically mention a person, and you would have to reference some external knowledge about who that person is. Um, I don't have a ready example for you, but like you could imagine the sorts of implications. I, I could be talking about somebody up there, give some very specific examples of some actions that they did without naming them, and it would require you to connect the dots in your mind to understand exactly who I am, who it was I was talking about. Um, so there are per se and per quad defamation cases in Ohio, and in my mind it's important to determine um, one, which type of claim is pled, and two, what the complaint says if it's a per se defamation case. Yeah. So this isn't an actual case, so you don't have to worry about but it is a real thing. So one of the mayoral candidates in town uh, claimed on stage during a town hall that the other mayoral candidate had not attended the meetings of a board he sat on, right? It was later found out that the, um, let's say candidate A's claims were made based upon the attendance roles of committees on the board that candidate B did not sit on anyway. Mm -hmm. Right, so mm -hmm. they just use committee roles, not the whole board attendance board meeting. Um, so I, it was clear. So it wasn't you didn't you wouldn't have to um, interpret who he was talking about. It was very clear. He met. He said his name. He said all these things. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm trying to find that line between defamatory on its face to say this is a person running for a public office and they served on a public board and they didn't go. Right? How it's not. You know, offense. It's not like you know the old like learned hand. I know it when I see it. I mm -hmm. see, right? But on the same, uh, on the other side of it, it is very clearly used for a particular purpose. Um, but it's possible that when the statement was made, the candidate, you know, relying on a team, a research team, did not realize he was making a false statement. Sure, sure. And, and I would say that that implicates two issues. One, the actual malice issue about if they didn't actually know it was false when they said it, even if they were mistaken, uh -huh. that is exactly the type of statement that New York Times Sullivan versus Sullivan is meant to protect. Uh, there's this idea of the breathing space in our political discourse mm -hmm. where we would be significantly chilled if we had to make sure that all of our research was totally locked down and tight before we were to make um, some statements about something. The other thing that I would say, which is I think a really interesting issue on this per se versus per quad issue, is the idea of an injury to trade or occupation and the defining of that occupation as a, a government official, as an elected official. Um, in my mind, the First Amendment, you know, one of the, the base, most basic reasons for the First Amendment is to provide exactly those kinds of interactions, to, to speak freely, and we'll go over some cases back from the early common law that, that discuss this uh, concept, but you know the idea. I think of that injury to trade or occupation as really more relating to, to private plaintiffs mm -hmm. rather than you injure my trade or occupation as an elected official, right? As a, as a government official, um, I, I think that you know the First Amendment is intended to protect those types of discussions and give that sort of breathing room mm -hmm. uh, to to allow for some even mistaken false statements. Um, as long as the, the speaker didn't have affirmative knowledge of their falsity. And it gets to this, um, this basic idea of who determines these dispositive issues in these defamation cases. So who decides what is defamatory? Uh, that's a great example of whether it's defamatory that you did not attend a certain board meeting, right? Is it defamatory if you say, um, you know, that I'm a, a many number of things. If you, if you say I'm a bad lawyer or a bad teacher or any of these things, is that actually defamatory or is that just a valid criticism of me? Uh, two, who decides what's true and false and what's verifiable? Um, the, this, uh, the false statement of fact in that first element of defamation, one of the considerations on whether something is a fact or an opinion, we'll talk a little bit more about this too, is whether something is verifiable. But, you know, there are some things where you could say are easy verifiable, right? The light was green, the light was red. There are some other things that are not so easy to verify, right? 
Um, there are a lot of defamation cases about whether somebody is a racist or not, for example. Uh, you could see lots of shades of gray within that accusation. One person saying, you know, I don't have a racist bone in my body. Other people saying, you know, I, I felt some certain microaggressions or whatever you want to say, and I'm going to say that, you know, that, that leads me to believe that, that you have, you know, prejudicial views or something like that. There's a lot, I know it's a controversial example, but there are lots of gray areas within there that it makes it very hard to determine whether or not you can verify that as a fact. And finally, the idea of who should be a fact finder. Um, uh, again, I've referenced the role of the jury and the trial process as something that we sort of venerate in the United States as the, the key, most public fact-finding process. And there have even been cases where um, uh, courts have rejected a, you know, a government truth commission. So there was a case out of the Sixth Circuit called Susan B. Anthony List versus Dry House. I'm not sure if you're, you're familiar with it, but it, it, it uh, struck down Ohio's political false statements law which set up a, a board, a commission of the Board of Elections uh, that people could make complaints to, and the board would determine whether or not there was probable cause that a statement was a political false statement. The Sixth Circuit struck down this scheme and basically said if there's going to be a fact-finding process for these types of things, we've got to go through the courts and we've got to subject it to a jury if there is such a jury demand. Uh, and the, the government, again, it should not be in the business of determining what's true and what's not true. So some of the underlying issues with these defamation cases and ones that I'm particularly concerned with as a First Amendment lawyer are these slap cases that I've referenced. Um, strategic lawsuits against part uh, public participation are cases where generally more powerful people try to silence less powerful people. Um, all of those examples that I previously put up of a, of a bad Yelp review or an environmental activist or you know, a political activist um, or even some of the cases that we've gotten involved in in the clinic I've characterized as strategic lawsuits against partic public participation because they're filed not necessarily for the reason excuse me, of, of compensating the plaintiff for damages, but more so to silence or to censor the defendant, to stop this speech from happening in the first instance. Um, it, in my mind, that it, it's, a, it's a problem, and obviously it's a problem as, as a lot of state legislatures have recognized because they've introduced these laws called anti-slap laws. Uh, under a state with an anti-slap statute, it basically gives you an additional procedural remedy to, if somebody sues you for defamation, and, and they, they vary a bit, so um, the analysis will vary a bit, uh, but usually you can file what's called a special motion to strike after you receive the complaint that puts the plaintiff to their proof that they have to prove their case before you answer the complaint. And if they can't do that, then they're typically, uh, their, their lawsuit's typically dismissed and they're subject to fee shifting. Uh, so what it does is it prevents um, defendants who are engaged in public participation, and these, these statutes usually define public participation, some define them you know, narrowly to talk about the political process, some define them very broadly to say that anything that's a matter of public interest um, but, but it, it's to prevent defendants from getting buried in litigation uh, just because they criticize someone or something. Um, so the idea is, you know, if you're a restaurant and a customer and you get a, you know, a fly in your soup or what have you and you put that on the internet, um, if, if the, you know, one, if it's true, uh, truth would be an absolute defense, but it's hard in a lot of cases to get to the point where, you know, I've been sued for defamation because there was a fly in the soup and now I've got to go through the discovery process to you know, put on my affidavits or get deposition testimony of other people who's, who received flies in their soups um, and ultimately push that to a, you know, a, a jury fact finder if we get past summary judgment. Um, litigators in the room, you know how long that process can take and how expensive it can be. Um, and it's really a very onerous burden for somebody and you could see how somebody served with a defamation lawsuit for an allegation like that might say, this isn't worth it. I'll just take my statement down and I won't criticize this, this restaurant again. And again, that's a generic example and it could go anywhere from applying the suit to you know, more serious allegations of you know, abuse, harassment and things like that. But you can see the chilling effect um, involved when you're named as a defendant in a lawsuit. Um, it's very expensive to litigate these types of things and this, I want to come back to this Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press um, 
anti-slap stories because it, it sort of describes how these different cases can um, proceed in different um, jurisdictions and reach radically different results. So this Texas Yelp case was dismissed readily under their anti-slap statute. Had that case been filed in Ohio, it's possible that a, a judicial officer looks at it and says, you know, we have notice pleading in Ohio. Uh, under Civil Rule 8, you've pled your claim. You said you've been defamed and you said you've been damaged. We'll let this survive a motion to dismiss. Um, and if you can't prove an absence of genuine issue of material fact, we're gonna let it survive a motion for summary judgment. And all of a sudden we're doing a trial over a Yelp review and you know the expense and time that comes along with that. So keeping those competing issues in mind, um, I'm gonna turn back to some of the constitutional claims and describe a little bit about how, uh, again, defamation is a state tort that proceeds mostly in the state courts, but it's limited by federal law and how there can be radically different results based on the substance or the procedure of, of the Ohio law I'm sorry, the state law as it exists sort of under that constitutional cap. Following the New York Times versus Sullivan opinion, and there's a, a series of opinions, people typically call it New York Times versus Sullivan and its progeny, um, the cases that come after it that have expanded the actual malice doctrine. Um, there were, there's a line in, in Gertz, a case called Gertz versus Robert Welch, which expanded the actual malice standard from public officials to public figures. Um, that, that, that cited some of the, the uh, language we talked about earlier, that there's no such thing as a false idea in the political sense, and that the test for truth is in the marketplace of ideas. Um, certain lower courts grasped onto that language, that opinion language. There's no such thing as a false opinion to create what's called an opinion privilege. So they were to say, if, if anything is opinion, that is, it's not a verifiable fact, then that is not something that, um, that, that you can hold somebody liable for in defamation and really it's constitutionally protected. This is a Rehnquist dissent um, that, that rejects that analysis and says they never intended to use that language in Gertz to create a separate constitutional privilege for opinions. Uh, Justice Rehnquist says it's an attempt to solve with a meat ax a very subtle and difficult question. Um, which it really is. There's, there's lots of cases in this sort of era in the mid 80s that are um, you know, something that I might characterize as a clearly defamatory statement of fact, but are introed with, in my opinion, right? In my opinion, somebody is a, a committed this crime. In my opinion, somebody did this terrible thing that you know, injured me. Um, and there were lots of courts, on the lower courts, that were embracing this. They said it's couched as opinion. People who see that, can reasonably observe that, you know, it's they're, they're saying that it's not a fact, it's their opinion, and maybe I should go out and find the underlying facts and explore what my own opinion is. Um, ultimately, um, that, and my slides are a little out of order here, um, I've covered most of this, but uh, ultimately that, that opinion privilege was rejected by the, the United States Supreme Court in a case called Milkovich versus Lorraine Journal. This is where uh, the state of Ohio plays prominently in some of the defamation case law. A reporter, uh, Ted Diadon, who many of you may know, he reported for the Lorraine County Journal for a very long time, is now with Cleveland.com, the plain dealer. Um, he wrote an article about a, a fracas at a, uh, um, a wrestling match where a couple of coaches and wrestlers were involved in a little bit of a fight. There was a, an investigation down in Franklin County about what happened. And uh, this article basically said that these coaches showed up to this proceeding and perjured themselves. Uh, so they said they lied under oath about what happened there. Anyone who attended the meet um, knows in his heart that Milkovich and Scott lied at the hearing after each having given his solemn oath to tell the truth. Um, in, in this case, again, that is, we've talked about defamatory on their face statements, statements that you know, by their very nature implicate defamatory material. Um, and in this case, he said that they committed perjury um, at, uh, you know, in, a, in a judicial proceeding, that it's a, it's a crime, and he accused them of that in the papers. Uh, his argument in this case was, and, and one that prevailed for a long time, this case was in the courts for, for over a decade, um, was that this is an opinion and this is not a statement of fact. 
He's in the sports pages. He's, you know, people know that that's not as hard reporting as some of the journalists of the day. And this was his opinion, and he was trying to call out what he saw as somebody lying uh, for the purpose of, you know, exposing truth in the country. Um, this is the, the history from Westlaw of the case, and it went from the state courts up to the Supreme Court a couple times. <laughs> Cert was denied a couple times. Eventually, got up to the Supreme Court. Um, and in that, in the Supreme Court case in 1990, again, this article was written, um, I think, in the late 70s. Um, the Supreme Court rejected this opinion privilege. They said you can't just say something as opinion and have it insulated from defamation liability. Um, there are some of opinions that may imply uh, assertions of objective fact. So if you say that I've seen X, Y, and Z, and that leads me to the opinion that you know this defamatory statement, whatever it might be, um, if those X, Y, Z are not true, uh, and you've implied that they are, then that is still something that somebody can hold you liable for. Um, and the reason we're talking about this a bit uh, in the sense of constitutional protections is this was an Ohio case that went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court rejected the Ohio Court's interpretation of this opinion privilege, comes back down and actually settles. But following that case, the Ohio courts determined that the Ohio Constitution provides a separate and independent guarantee for the protection of opinion. So they read Milkovich, the Ohio Supreme Court reads Milkovich, uh, and, and decides that that Milkovich standard applying federal constitutional law uh, is, is either wrong as a matter of law and the speech protections that should be involved, or there's a separate and independent basis under the Ohio Constitution's uh, guarantee of freedom of speech. Yeah. I don't know if this is too obvious, but um... I mean, I saw the way that you put that excerpt from the Lorraine Journal in there. It seems like if he had finessed it a little bit more, he could have claimed this is opinion, right? But it was stated so blatantly, like anyone who saw this would know and we knew they were lying, right? But I mean, if, you know, if you can do this as an author, sort of say something like, um, you know, um, any other person, right? As opposed to, and then instead of saying, but they did it and sort of like leave it open-ended, like make your own conclusion or whatever, then this wouldn't have been an issue, right? I mean, do you know what I mean? Like the line between opinion and fact, to me that seemed like he was he was making an assertion of fact, right. but it could be very uh, gray. It, it, it can be a, a finessing of, of, of authorship. Right, right, and then it might actually get to the point where we truly need to find a fact finder to, to determine That's whether right. or not something is, you know, false or defamatory or, you know, whether enough of that cautionary, excuse me, the cautionary language was used to take it out of that assertion of fact. Um, but that would have all been before any of this, this stuff happened yeah. in, in that lawsuit. Um, so so uh, getting to the Ohio Constitution and its guarantee of, of freedom of speech, a lot of what the Ohio courts say is their uh, speech guarantees are sort of concomitant with the federal protections. Um, notwithstanding this decision um, uh, in, in Vail, that, that talks about a separate independent uh, guarantee of protection for opinion. Um, courts have generally said that, um, that this opinion privilege exists in Ohio. Um, it's not something that I see very much distinction in the case law. Um, and really, in my view, it, it gets to the point where um, the, even notwithstanding these substantive protections, really the procedural um, questions are the ones that are most important. It's not really what the substantive law says. It's more about how long are you in that lawsuit and when can you get out if you're a defendant or how long you have to pursue it as a plaintiff. So uh, it leads to some somewhat perverse incentives. This is a, a federal court case filed by a member of Congress, Devin Nunes, against CNN. Um, and there were some allegations, and uh, Congressman Nunes has filed a lot of defamation cases against a lot of different types of speakers. Uh, he's filed some against some parody Twitter accounts. He's filed some against some, some journalists. And he's filed some against uh, the whole networks themselves. Um, and and uh, Member Nunes is a, is a member of Congress out of California. And he sued uh, CNN, which I believe is a Delaware corporation. Um, but he sued them in the Eastern District of Virginia. And the court uh, transferred the venue to the Southern District of New York basically saying that they believe that the member was, was forward shopping. Uh, the Eastern District of Virginia is notorious for having a rocket docket for moving the cases very quickly. And you can see how that type of pressure could apply um, 
to to make some cases settle more quickly or to you know chill additional speech of the the type that that um, the the plaintiff here was concerned about. Um, and it gets to some of the technological questions that are involved. We talked a lot about the marketplace of ideas, and uh, in, in a lot of ways, we're in a very different media environment than we were in 1964, where the internet is around and things are, are disseminated so quickly um, that and, and disseminated through the internet. And there are some arguments that people make that you know things on the internet are everywhere. So everywhere has is a proper venue, everywhere is a proper jurisdiction for some of these things. Um, and I think it's important to recognize how. Uh, differing case law and differing substantive and procedural protections influence where, where defamation plaintiffs might file. Um, the other strategy that Devin Nunes has run into, Congressman Nunes has run into, is the application of these anti-slap statutes in federal court. And it gets back to the questions of whether we're applying procedure or substantive law in the federal courts. Um, but, but in some ways, people think that some of these filings are ways to avoid the application of these anti-slap statutes and survive that motion to dismiss on the argument that that is a, an element of procedural state law that doesn't apply in federal courts. So to put a finer point on it, it's not that you get to avail yourself of the procedural advantages as a defendant of an anti-slap statute, but what you've got to do is pursue a motion to dismiss under Rule 12 or a motion for summary judgment under Rule 56 um, which, which doesn't always contain the same standards. And finally, we arrive to um, the, the basis of, of uh, Mr. Abrams' op-ed. Um, the idea of a constitutional reform about these actual malice standard. Uh, and this has really come about um, as a result of a couple dissents from certiorari by uh, Justice Thomas and by Justice Gorsuch one from 2019 in a Bill Cosby defamation case where Justice Thomas in his dissent um, from, from the denial of certiorari of that case basically says that the Supreme Court in 1964 in New York Times versus Sullivan made up actual malice whole cloth. And we shouldn't be abiding by this idea, uh, reflexively apply this policy um, unless it, it, it um, was the, the type of concept that the framers had around uh, the time that the Constitution was written. An original critique, originalist critique of the actual malice standard, basically saying there's no evidence that anybody at common law thought that this actual malice standard should be required. Um, in opposition, there was a lot of backlash from media lawyers generally. Um, this is a, actually started as a, um, a self-published blog piece but ultimately has is, is been turned into a law review article that will be forthcoming in the Louisiana Law Review. Um, and providing an originalist uh, sort of retort to Justice Thomas's um, originalist critiques. So um, Matthew Schaefer, who's counsel at CBS Viacom, um, dove into the common law case law of the early states and even back to, to Great Britain and England um, where he examined libel cases and saw that there were two sort of branches of cases where uh, courts were really taking into account the mental state of a defendant to evaluate whether somebody could be liable for libel. Uh, so a lot of them came in through admission of state of mind evidence. That is, courts found that it was relevant evidence to consider whether something was made with malice or whether it was not. Um, and, and even some courts back in the uh, the early 19th century finding things that, that a lack of malice could constitute a substantive privilege for these types of things. Um, but the, the idea persists. So there is a, uh, another case, another denial of certiorari, um, where uh, the Supreme Court did not take an opportunity to re-review the actual malice standard. And Thomas again dissented and said that instead of continuing to insulate those who perpetuate or perpetrate lies from traditional remedies like libel suits, we should give them only the protection the First Amendment requires. Um, before this decision came down, there was some idea that Justice Thomas was perhaps alone on an island in thinking that, but there was also a, a Gorsuch dissent here, where he gets to some really, I think, interesting questions about the changing landscape, and I've, I've mentioned this a lot of times. Um, 
you know, we're not in an era where it's the New York Times and the Washington Post and, you know, your TV that you get over the air and nothing else. We're in an era of, you know, CNN and Fox News Network and MSNBC and One American News Network and all of these different uh, media entities, but your Twitters and your Facebooks and your, your social media companies that, that uh, proliferate some of these things. Um, and the idea that if we're talking about a marketplace of ideas and that brand icy envision of what free speech should be, we're sort of more in a less of a marketplace and more of like a curated shopping experience where you know algorithms amplify certain things and downplay other things. There's a, a decent amount of, and there are studies out there about this, a decent amount of inauthentic activity. Uh, so, you know, bots or troll farms from even from foreign nation states that are attempting to influence some of the discussion around it. And the idea is that back in the, the 60s and 70s when this doctrine was developing, um, or even way back when at the founding, you know, we're talking about two soapboxes on opposite ends of a public square, and we're a true marketplace of ideas. Who can gain the most followers? Um, not followers as in the social media sites, <laughs> but you know, who, who can gain the most audience and who can hand out the most pamphlets and whose ideas will ultimately win out. And maybe those concepts aren't truly as applicable as we believe them to be now um, when there are algorithms deciding what these things are, when there's you know, some perhaps affirmative misinformation out there about even our electoral processes, um, and, and what, what does it truly mean to, to hold somebody liable for a defamation case um, under that actual malice standard and whether that should be reconsidered. Um, it gets into other interesting questions. Go ahead. Yeah, what about the Supreme Court's decision on the uh, church military funeral situation where you know the jury, I presume reading it, that they factually found uh, def defamation. And of course, the Supreme Court says, no, it wasn't defamation, and you don't get any money. Um, this, this is the, the Snyder versus Phelps Westboro Baptist? Uh, yeah. OK, OK. And, and that, that uh, is a case with, with uh, uh, picketing at a military funeral, some very offensive words. And to me, that case is more of a case about um, offensiveness. So, you know, that's a content-based discrimination case where the Supreme Court is saying just because somebody's offended by something doesn't mean you can recover for it. Um, right, I, I think of it more as a, an IIED case, an intentional infliction of emotional distress case more so than a defamation case. And, and those, you know, the statements that were at issue there, um, I would say aren't really capable of defamatory content. Um, very offensive language, so I, I typically, even though I'm a First Amendment lawyer, I don't typically uh, speak it all out at presentations like this. But the things about what God believes, for example, which are what was on some of those signs, is a very difficult statement to say is factual. If God hates a certain kind of people, how do we disprove that, or how do we show that it was verifiable or not? It was. I, I, I got the impression that part of it was like specifically directed toward the deceased military personnel as opposed to anyone who's in the military, you know, is a no good uh, bum. Uh, but they were specifically talking about this person. And I thought that differentiation might have been so-called exception. You, you know, I, I didn't prepare Snyder versus Salt for this talk, so I may be <laughs> I may this guy on this. Um, but but I, my understanding of the facts of that case, and again, I'm making this understanding because I haven't read it very recently, but I think the picketing in that case was directed towards the military generally and their ideas that they were letting uh, gay people, homosexual people serve, and that was the, that was the impetus of it. But I, I'm not sure whether the deceased fell in that category or not. I, I thought I read that it was actually including both, that it had both the big picture. Anyone in the military, you know, is no good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there was also some specifics to this, John Doe, whose funeral we're now observing. Sure, sure. And, and I would just say that also that it's the, the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, especially in the last decade plus, I think Snyder versus Phelps was in the late aught, 2009 or something. But there's been a very uh, uh, primarily driven in my mind by Justice Kennedy, um, uh, uh, and this idea that offensive speech, regulating speech on the basis that it's offensive is a content-based 
viewpoint-based uh, regulation, and thus it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't uh, survive First Amendment scrutiny. There have been a number of cases like this. There's the Mattal versus Tam case. It's about a trademark registration of a racial slur. Uh, an Asian band wanted to register a name called the Slants, and the USPTO initially rejected them uh, because they said this is offensive and you can't uh, register derogatory marks. A similar thing happened with the Washington football team and their registration. Uh, and Justice Kennedy in Mattal versus Tam basically said that giving offensive, giving offense is a viewpoint. Um, we can't regulate speech just on the basis that it's offensive to somebody. We have to have something else. And it almost you know, dovetails nicely with this false speech idea where it's, we're, we're not punishing speech just on the basis that it's false. What we're really punishing is the, um, or, or we're punishing it incidental to compensating somebody for a reputational harm. So uh, getting back to uh, Floyd Abrams' uh, op-ed, he draws, and I would encourage you all to read it, it was in yesterday's New York Times. Um, it's the reason I don't have printed slides for you all, because I, I rushed to fit this in here. But he makes a comparison between the United States and England, and what he's, he's sort of doing here is saying, here's what would happen if we reconsidered the actual malice standard. If we go back to, um, to a, a First Amendment or, or a country without this actual malice standard, what you'll really get is a chilling effect. And he talks about some recent publications or attempted publications uh, that, that people in England just didn't want to publish because of their, uh, the, the threat of liability under their libel laws. Uh, so they quote a publisher that basically says this decision to not publish has nothing to do with the quality of your research or your scholarly credibility. It's simply a question of risk tolerance in light of our limited resources. This sets a very perverse incentives where, you know, maybe perhaps the most powerful media entities or publishers have the ability to fight, uh, you know, a defamation threat or a threat of censorship. But you can see how those those carry on effects, those cascading effects, would chill folks that don't have the ability to fight something like that, um, notwithstanding their belief that it's good research or that it's it's uh, it meets certain standards of fact finding. Um, this, what Floyd Abrams says, is, is precisely the type of threat that New York Times versus Sullivan was meant to protect. We want to encourage publishers to speak about matters of public concern, and we're only willing to punish those, uh, punish those who speak as such if they knowingly knew, know, knew that their statements were false and that there were some real damages that came out of it. I do have some resources. If anybody would like the slides, I'd be happy to send out some of these things. Um, uh, a full version of this Matthew Schaefer article and some other articles about the changing uh, landscape of defamation law in social media. Um, you can also follow our clinic's work on Twitter at CWRU First Am Clinic. I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions, but that is my presentation for this afternoon. I do thank you all for coming, uh, and welcome back to campus. Thanks.